Now? Yes. Is this, oh, it works. Okay. Uh, the, uh, I think I'll start by saying that this is, is uh, promises to be. Uh, I'm not sure who's promising it, but Karen, you know, Angeline, everybody, promising to be an unforgettable evening. And when you have something that has such high expectations uh, to be unforgettable in particular, you have to imagine that somebody will forget something. And so the most forgettable thing, I hope, is, is what I'm doing right now. Uh, I want to say about a couple things about Professor Ambrose, and then I'll turn it over to my wife, who will say more about Professor Ambrose. Uh, it turns out that... Uh, I think, I'm not sure about the chronology exactly, but I think uh, uh, perhaps none of you know that I was, perhaps none of you know that I was born in Louisiana. I'm a native of Louisiana. Uh, and I think that, that when I was born, uh, you were, Philip, you were living in, there, in, uh, in Louisiana. Uh, so we have a Louisiana connection that we didn't even know about. I didn't last long there. I got to Vermont at the age of two weeks. Uh, I applied from, from college uh, to, to college. I applied to the uh, University of Vermont because it's my state university, and I was accepted. Uh, and had I, had I chosen to come here, uh, I would have had uh, Professor Ambrose. Uh, he, he was starting uh, at the same time I would have started. And had that happened, I might have uh, had a little more patience with Greek. <laughs> Speaking of patience, uh, the uh, Professor Ambrose is a patient man. Uh, he's very patient with. Did you hear that? <laughs> that you're a patient man. Six thousand dollars worth of hearing. <laughs> you still can't hear it. And I didn't hear it. You're a patient man. <laughs> He's a patient man. He's very, some of you have been his students, uh, and you know that he can be very patient as a, as a teacher. Uh, and uh, very patient as a colleague. Uh, but there's a stroke of impatience in there uh, that makes he's a Gemini, after all. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the stroke of impatience is what, what gives him a color. Uh, when I first came to to to, uh, to UVM in, in 1980, computers were not quite on the scene yet, but there was selectric typewriters, and uh, there was, or was it the Greek typewriter? It was the Greek manual typewriter. The Greek manual typewriter, and <laughs> Professor Ambrose was trying to make it do something, and <laughs> a grown-up man, he sat there at the t and the typewriter didn't do exactly what he wanted, and he got more and more annoyed, starting, starting at, with the fingers and the hands, and they were waving around, and then the feet started going back and forth like this, and finally he hit the key or something, and then it wasn't the right key, and he said, Shai <laughs> That was a moment of impatience. <laughs> uh, but... I later found, uh, I chanced to open up uh, a Latin text, and I found uh, uh, something that, a uh, description of a man, an eminent Roman, uh, perhaps none of you will have ever heard of him. His name was Mamercus Aurelius, sorry, Mamercus Aurelius Scaurus, uh, very eminent, described by the elder Seneca as being as being not only erudite, as one must be to be, to be an outstanding uh, uh, in eloquence and, and uh, in rhetoric, uh, but disertissimus, that means he was really good at rhetoric, and venustissimus, most charming, most witty. His words were charming and they, they flowed off. And yet, this is the best of it, not only for all these things, he was a man who never let anyone's slightest bit of foolishness go unnoticed. <laughs> Nolius umquam infunitam so, what's the word? Stultitiam transira passus est. Never let anyone's foolishness go by. Now Scaurus, uh, he may have let some things go by without commenting, uh, but uh, 
I know that Professor Ambrose never missed anything of foolishness, but he wisely did not always, this is where the other side of the patients comes, good patients again, he always had a reasonable tact in whether to let it go unnoticed, even if unpunished. It's <laughs> my turn. After that, I think I can truly say he's a man who needs no introduction, however. <laughs> Um, I think that, that uh, John asked us to speak because, ex except for Phil, we're the oldest guys left and in, in the classics. Well, except we're retired, thank goodness for everyone else. Um, old, yes. But Phil is a complete scholar, I have to tell you. He has done so many things. He has published works in, on Greek poetry, epic poetry and drama, Roman epic, Roman drama, what are we going to do, and, and including many, many other things. He has translated into a workable English singing translation all of the cantatas of Bach that a friend of mine attending the Marlboro Festival said, oh my God, you can sing them. I said, yes, that's the point. <laughs> that, um, you know, you just want, don't want an, an English version of what the words are. You want to be able to do justice to the music as well. He is a musician. How many of you have heard him sing? How many of you have heard him on the harpsichord or the piano? Yes, indeed. He is, in, in many respects, a wonder of nature. And he taught so many different classes at UVM in the course of his career from 1962 to 2006, count the years, people. Um, and I think he could have taught anything he wished because he instilled in me and I think all of his students the principle of the cognitio omnis antiquitatis, a knowledge of all antiquity not just literature, if that's your thing, not just history, which is, of course, my thing, not just whatever your thing is, chemistry or mathematics, my second love, no, math, not chemistry, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, um, but all of these, these wonderful things that you had to know at all, the complete person knows it all, Cicero said. He also taught us how to read Cicero. Read it word for word and translate that way, it will make sense, you'll see. He's right, try it someday, people. He could do all of these things, and when it was time for him to retire and do what he wanted, we had a conundrum. Okay, who's going to teach about Ovid? We need a musician. Who's going to do drama? We need three people. Well, we got two. And fortunately, between them, Professors Franklin and Chu, cover the bases by magic, and they're the ones who have brought you this wonderful program tonight. Another thing that a complete scholar does is continues to work. And Phil has put online, I think it was only last year, wasn't it? It was his um, transcription, for those of you who don't know it, of Bernardino Daniello's translation and commentary into Italian in the 16th century of Virgil's Georgics. And he has translated, yes, Daniela's letter to his readers and to a patron into English, and you can read them on the Classics website also, explaining that agriculture is the most wonderful of the liberal arts. All of the liberal arts are wonderful. And Philip has never lost faith that they will always continue both at the University of Vermont and at everywhere else, not only our program, but every program of learned letters that is worth pursuing. And we now turn it over to a younger generation to make it so, Professor Ambrose. Well, I 
am speechless. So I shall have to read. Maybe I will recover from that generous introduction, introductions. Can you all hear me? Can you all hear me now? Yes. You see, I have these new things, and it sounds to me as though I were both rasping and screaming. So it could be that I'm really just whispering. So seriously, if you can't hear me, or if you can't agree with some pronunciation of a Greek word and want to hear it again, uh, raise your hand, let me know. <laughs> Greek drama was public poetry. When you hold a text of a Greek play in your hand, you're looking at an event. Don't look just at the pages. Don't look at the script. Imagine that there were, behind this work, there was a composer, author. There were citizen actors. These were not com professional authors. They were citizen authors. Professional actors, not citizen actors, citizen chorus of Athenians, citizen arrangers, architects of the scene, citizen mask makers, costumes made by women, I'm pretty sure, instrumentalists, and finally a theater large enough to hold the entire citizen population of Athens, containing men, and now we are smart enough to know women, some children. The priest of Dionysus and 10 citizen judges. And at the city Dionysia, at least, some foreigners. We certainly have parallels to thank this evening. Um, I don't know whether you have programs, but Upstairs you will, I hope, find the names of the people, the citizens of Burlington, a size, a city a bit larger than Athens as far as citizen population was concerned. I hope you find the names and, and realize what, what they have offered this evening. We have music, we have scenery, we have costumes, we have students who are good students and working hard to do what they do in their courses and so on, and they have devoted hours and hours of time. I can, if I'm lucky, memorize five lines of anything. And I was here at the dress rehearsal last night. I didn't hear a flubbed line in the whole two hours. So I'll stop with that, but you, I hope, have inferred how really as humbled and astonished at the work that has been prepared for us this evening. So let me talk now about the play. Produced in the spring of 412 BCE, of course, 5th century, late 5th century, produced in the springtime at the city Dionysia of 412 were three plays of Euripides, and of course, three plays by two other composers. Two of uh, the plays are extant. The Helen, perhaps the Ion, and then a fragmentary Andromeda. All of those plays have a happy end. For this and other reasons, we have built tonight's production as a kind of tragic comedy. Tragic comedy, I believe, is more or less a modern critical term. Since Shakespeare or so, we've, we've talked about measure for measure as a tragic comedy, for example. Um, it has a calc in Greek, hilaro tragoidiae. But that has nothing to do with what we mean by, tra by tragic comedy. Tra uh, hilaro, hilarious tragedies 
or spoofs, particularly in Greek Italy, of Greek, of Greek tragedy. It was an old thing of making, making fun of, of, the, of the serious. If uh, there is no uh, relationship between the Helen and these spoofs. However, in the year after the production of this play, Aristophanes mined our play for the comic effects he wanted to produce in his play. The name of the play was Thesmophoria Zeusi, the women at the Thesmophoria, which was a, an exclusively female festival. And uh, it was produced, now that's 411. Aristophanes produced two women's plays in that year, probably the Lysistrata at the Linnean Festival and the Thesmophoria Zeusi at the city Dionysia. Now, um, uh, before I say anything more, I want to say that I believe that Aristophanes and Euripides were in cahoots with these two plays. In Aristophanes, Euripides will be sent up broadly, and I think he would be delighted to have been so treated. The comedy is about a man, Euripides' in-law, who is dressed as a woman to infiltrate the festival of these women, because the women have gathered this year, they have on their agenda to prosecute and he execute Euripides for the terrible things he said about women in his plays. Well, in our play, The Helen, you will see that Menelaus natters on and on in embarrassment about the fact that he's not dressed properly. And Helen joins him. She's embarrassed, too. He is a king in rags and is not happy. He's shipwrecked, of course, and he's just wearing left uh, flotsam and jetsam from the shipwreck. Now, Euripides' first king in rags was produced in a play called The Telephus back in 438. Telephos, a Mysian king, had been wounded in the battle with the Greeks when they arrived on their venture to Troy. Telephos was wounded. The wound wouldn't heal. He goes to an oracle. The only way you're going to get this wound healed is to have the wounder heal it. He needs the rust off. Achilles' spear. So he goes to the Greek camp, disguised in rags. Euripides became notorious for having produced a character out of character with regard to what he was wearing. A king should wear kingly garb. At the beginning of the Thesmophoria Zeusi, the effeminate tragic poet Agathon uh, eventually loans the in-law of Euripides, one of his women's costumes. He has a whole array of them. You, the point is, says Agathon, you've got to dress your character the way they are, to give in a way that fits their character. Yeah. In the 438 Telephos play, Telephos goes to the camp dressed in these rags and is found out. He's in danger. So what does he do? He snatches the then infant Orestes and hops on an altar. And that gesture is the gesture of a suppliant. We'll talk about that later. Now, in Aristophanes' play, In-law, dressed as a woman, is discovered by the woman as being not a woman. 
So what does he do? He snatches up the baby of one of the women and hops on an altar. Here is the cover, you can see it. There is comic character Telephos. Well, it's the in-law dressed as Telephos. And here is his sword, and here is the baby. No, no, not a baby at all, but a wine skin. <laughs> and the woman is horrified, my baby, my baby. And she's holding out a great crater to hold the blood, no, not the blood, the wine that he's about to let loose out of the... Well, I'm thinking that that whole scene in the Thesmophoria Zeusi is triggered by the interest in suppliancy and in the costume of the Helen in the play before, the, in the, uh, the play in the previous year. Aristophanes goes on then in that play, in that comedy, to um, imitate two scenes from Euripides, other scenes in uh, the Euripides production. Um, in comes, oh, excuse me, I, I didn't tell you that, of course, the in-law is caught by the women, and then he's tied to a stake, to a pillar, and is about to suffer all manner of, uh, of um, disrespectful treatment, uh, and worse. Uh, Euripides comes in dressed as Menelaus, the Menelaus of the Helen, to save him. That fails. Later, Euripides comes in again as Perseus. Well, where is Perseus? He's the chief character in the other play produced in 413, the Andromeda. No, excuse me, not 413, 412. With the Helen, the Andromeda, you remember she's tied to a rock, and if he can, if Perseus can free her, he gets to marry her. So it's a play about the sea, it's about uh, conjugal love, and it's um, imitated in the Thesmophoria Zeusi. So um, it's pretty clear from this that. Aristophanes looking at, feeding on the Helen of Euripides has found a lot of funny business there and exploits it. But whatever the funny business there, I'd like to proceed by talking about the elements of the Helen that are quite thoroughly within the tradition of tragedy. This is not silly tragedy, and it's not a silly play, although there are laughable moments. So I've talked, uh, entitled this not because of the alliteration, but because of the elements that I want to cover. Rags to riches, recognition, rescue, and reconciliation. So first, rag to riches. As I said, Menelaus is ashamed of his shoddy clothing, unfit for a hero of the Trojan War. And Helen is embarrassed for him as well. But his rags will be put away in the end by the deceived Theoclymenus, the son of the king, Proteus, whose tomb is the focal point of our play. The rags that Menelaus wears actually keeps the Oclymenus in their first encounter from recognizing who this fellow is. He does, wouldn't have, would dream that we have here a Greek king. This is this creature. You know, you'll see him in the in the play go up and take a sniff. He doesn't even smell quite right. And uh, He's just about to be bamboozled by Menelaus and Helen into helping them offer a funeral at sea for Menelaus, um, presumed to be dead. That's the important thing. Of course, they know that he's alive. And Theoclymenus, eager to woo and impress 
Helen, he wants to marry her desperately, offers generous help. He offers a sacrificial bull. He offers a brand new ship um, with crew. He offers weapons and, and most importantly, finery fit for a king. We've gone from rags to riches. Second point, recognition. How uh, is the couple recognized? How do they recognize each other? A central figure of Greek drama is anagnoris, as the Greeks called it, recognition. Example in tragedy, Aeschylus' lib libation bearers. Electra is at the tomb of her father. She sees footprints. She measures them with her own. Ah, they must be my brother's footprints. Euripides, in his own Electra, says, what nonsense. Electra and Orestes are the same size. <laughs> nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Euripides, in his Electra, lets the, uh, an old tutor remember and recognize Orestes by a scar. That's sort of doubtful, too. Uh, Sophocles avoids the whole business by having Electra recognize her brother's signet ring, which is as good an idea as plastic, I suppose, a credit card. But when we get to the Helen, uh, such a short uh, scene as, as, as those, we don't find. Uh, first of all, there are three separate recognition scenes. Teucer comes in early on, a Greek, who's also wandering like Menelaus, but he's right there in front of the palace, and he confronts Helen, and he is a shock, this can't be Helen, and so forth. But the scene, he doesn't recognize what his eyes tell him he's looking at, namely, Helen of, of Sparta. Uh, so, um, uh, he never really is convinced, but it's extremely important for the plot because he informs Helen that Menelaus has perished at sea. He also informs her that her mother has killed herself. He also informs her that uh, that Hermione, her daughter, Helen's daughter, is unmarriable now because of the family disgrace. And finally, that her brothers, Castor and Pollux, no longer exist on earth. They're now in heaven as stars. So that sets up sort of the, the working knowledge with which the play can go on. The um, second recognition scene is uh, when Electra, excuse me, <laughs> Helen and Menelaus meet for the first time. And they go on for about a hundred lines or so in rather vapid conversation. And Menelaus just doesn't get it. And surely the audience is saying, come on, you dimwit, out with it, can't you see? It? Something like that. It's, 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 very, it's very tedious. And so then we come to the third scene, and that's when the shipmate of Menelaus comes in to say, oh, for heaven's sake, the Helen that you left with us, your shipmates in the cave, she's vanished into thin air. It's only then that Menelaus finally gets it. <laughs> that's the most protracted uh, recognition effort that I know of in Euripidean drama. But there's even a larger point about recognition, and that is the recognition of what the true character of Helen is. And that really starts with her anxiety and grief at having lost any uh, reputation at all with her own Greek people to the very end. And uh, <coughs> so it's this larger sense of tragedy as, in fact, a whole, I think you would agree, would be Oedipus, who's uh, very intelligent. And so long as he sees, he doesn't, he isn't able 
even with his sense or his eyes, to recognize who he is, from whom he comes. And when he finally does acknowledge what that truth is, he blinds himself. So that the whole play, the whole play is an act of anagnosis. I come now to rescue. And rescue comes into three, it has three elements I would uh, uh, talk about. The first is suppliancy. The suppliant is, uh, the suppliancy is a ritual. Someone needing safety runs to an altar or to a tomb and sits on it to pull the suppliant off the tomb is a great no-no. It's the worst way to offend the gods. And we will see suppliance and suppliancy through the, this play. Another element of rescue is sailing. sailing. Sailing metaphors, sailing images are part and parcel of Greek tragedy. And this play is obviously about sailing, shipwreck, moments, uh, it gives the momentum for the action of the play, and sailing home is the last element of rescue. Another uh, element of rescue is sacrifice. Uh, <laughs> we, don't, we do not lack for killing in tragedy, but it's all the more dangerous in Greek tragedy because it is characterized as a what the Greeks call a sphagie. The word almost sounds like what it is, slaughter and sacrificial slaughter. Helen, in our play, threatens, in fact, when she, in the depths of her depression, she threatens to stab herself and make with that, with her blood, a, a, a sacrificial offering to the three goddesses who got her in such a jam, and even to the Paris who was forced into association with her. Um, Menelaus, when he gets help from Theoclymenus um, with the bull, and he sacrifices the bull, kills the bull. But out there at sea, he also has to kill a good number of the Egyptian crew. And it's only the one crewman who jumps into the sea and is picked up by fishermen who comes back to reveal the truth to Theoclymenus. Um, it's not quite showtime yet, so I can digress a little bit. Uh, I know that reading the Odyssey is very popular these days. Do you remember in book four, uh, three and four, but especially in book four, when Telemachus is the guest of whom? Menelaus. Menelaus and Helen. Helen. And Helen uh, narrates for him the Trojan War because, in brief, because she's weaving it into a tapestry. But he, uh, he really is not in Egypt, but off the coast of Egypt on the island of Pharos, and he really wants to go home and he wants to sail on home. Every time he tries to leave, the winds push him back. His, uh, uh, so he talks to the daughter of Proteus, whose name is Adothea. It's a curiously similar name to Theonoe in our play. Ado gives us uh, the, the first part of the word Adolon, which is a phantom, and Thea, goddess, phantom goddess, or something like that, or knowing goddess, perhaps. Uh, she is the daughter of Proteus. Now, this is not King Proteus, whose tomb we will observe through the play. This is the old man of the sea, and what does he have for talent? He can change into various shapes, animal shapes, and whatnot. And Adorthea, when Menelaus goes back and says, why the heck can't I get out of here? Why do the winds push me back? She says, you must go to uh, rest, to sneak up on Proteus and wrestle with him and make him tell you. 
So that's what Menelaus does, and he runs away, and he changes. And finally, the old man of the sea gets what old men do. He got tired of it all, and he gives in. And he says, the reason you can't get back is that you haven't offered the proper sacrifices. You need to offer a hecatomb. By the way, he's also told him that his brother Agamemnon has died. So Menelaus quickly offers the hecatomb, which means a hundred oxen. I don't know how he had time to go out and slay a hundred oxen, but that was sort of an exaggeration term for a sacrificial offering. And he constructs a cenotaph for his brother Agamemnon. And he gets in his ship, and the favoring wind, there is a technical term I have to give you, uron, the uros, is a wind that exclusively leads you home. It's translated as, I think, our text of the play, auspicious, but it specifically is the wind which is needed by all of those Greeks who needed to return home in their nostoi, in their nostos to home, uh, back to Greece. And he gets that uron. Now, uh, this um, technical term is very important in our play. Because as soon as Menelaus cuts the bull, the bull's blood spurts, home bringing spurts of blood. And immediately, the home bringing winds appear as well. And they're off and running back to Sparta. So uh, uh, that's all I'm going to say about sacrifice for now. Um, Theoclymenus now is fairly shocked, as you can imagine, to discover that he's been so duped, and further, that he's lost a bride. This is a whole play about regaining a bride, re regaining a bride, but it's also a play about losing one. And Theoclymenus is sort of a, a bad guy prince, and he, uh, he, he's, he's not easy to love, <laughs> as you will see. And so we can expect the worst from him. But the worst doesn't come. He will not kill his sister, Theonoe, for her having helped Menelaus and Helen. Why? Because help is on the way from heaven. The Dioscuri appear, and Castor tells him, you must not harm your sister, and so forth and so on. And the sister earlier, Pinoe, in agreeing to help the couple, Helen and Menelaus, said, I agree with you, for if I oppose my brother's impiety, I will render him pious. By pious, it means virtuous. The virtuosity, the virtuousness, sorry, the virtuousness of the father whose tomb had protected his potential victims, uh, Menelaus and others. Um, Reconciliation, then, is really what I've been talking about, and that was the last element in, in the, uh, that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the uh, Greek drama very often ends in some kind of reconciliation, particularly within the family. I said that Greek drama was public drama. Uh, art for art's sake was centuries and centuries off. It was for the people, it was for the city. But what was the city? The city of Athens was thought of as a cluster, as a conglomerate of families. And these mythical families of Greek drama, they suffered and grieved and misbehaved the way families in real life did and do. And that's what I mean when I say Greek drama was public. It was produced by Greek drama, but it was for the people. Um, a final note on reconciliation. 
Our Proteus on the play in the play is a king, a mortal king now dead. In life and death, he was a protector. He, Helen was sent to Egypt so that he, Proteus, would protect. His name gives us our word Protean. His name is first found with a god who can change shapes. But this guy does not change shapes. Does not change shape at all in a play that is filled with changes and sudden reversals. One of the things, a technical term in Greek drama, is the peripety, that is the reversal of something, an unexpected change. And there he is, fixed, firm, and faithful throughout. Um, to this point, do you have questions? Because I'm about ready to stop. Okay, then I have a question for you. <laughs> one of the oddities, one of the strange things about this play is its organization. Um, I'm so impressed with the chorus, but you'll see them. You have to listen carefully for what they have to say. It's sometimes hard, but their dancing and their coordination, it's just, it's just beautiful. But the odd thing is that these formal choral odes that you expect to have in Greek drama come extremely late in this play. The first one doesn't start until well after line 1000. And then they come in quick succession. Um, the second one is the one that really interests me. It's about Persephone, the rape of Persephone, and the grief of her mother. Where is she, where is she, and the mother's having changed nature into sterility and so forth. Uh, if you listen carefully early on in the play, you will hear Helen say that while she was picking flowers, Hermes came and stole them away. Well, that's exactly the situation that Persephone was in that she was carried off while she was picking flowers. Persephone is a daughter who causes grief to the mother. Helen is a daughter who causes shame and grief and death to a mother. Helen is a mother herself who is grieving for her own daughter. Well, stay tuned for 408. <laughs> We're in 411. And in 408, Helen will come back again and she'll almost be killed at the end of the play. And Orestes will instead marry her daughter Hermione. Um, I thank you for listening. I thank you for making me work myself to death, worrying about talking to you. And just this <laughs> afternoon, I had a thought, and if there's an historian to help me, watching the play, how long have you been away, says Helen. Well, that was 10 years at Troy, and then we've been at sea for 17 years. In 413, 412, we are about 17 years into the Peloponnesian War, which began in 431. Uh, um, you can't convince me that with the Troades, the Trojan women in 415, the birds of Aristophanes in 414, an escapist play, let's get the hell out of Athens, play, 413, the Electra, in which Euripides, in effect, announces that the Helen is coming next year because he says Helen was not sent to Troy, she was sent to Egypt. And also in the Electra of Euripides, the Dioscore say, we're busy, I mean, we're in a hurry, we've got to go off and help, 
a fleet in trouble in Sicilian waters. We are in what period of the Peloponnesian War? That last foolish effort, misstep, the Sicilian expedition, when 100, 200 ships were sent off to Sicily on a ill-fated uh, expedition that ended up with the loss of the entire fleet, the capture of those who hadn't been killed, the capture of Athenian soldiers, where they were put into the stone pits, and their only hope of escaping was to recite beautiful verses of Euripides. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ambrose.